All right, welcome back from lunch, everybody. Um, so uh, this afternoon we'll talk about uh, parallel programming with Do Concurrent and OpenMP, which are a couple of uh, like shared memory, like single node type uh, parallel programming models uh, that Fortran mostly supports. Um, so let's get started with Do Concurrent. So do concurrent is basically some special syntax around what would normally just be a regular old do loop. Um, so you add the concurrent keyword after do, and then the loop bounds appear in parentheses with a slightly different syntax. <clears throat> You're allowed to put uh, a type declaration for the loop indices, so that you can set, so uh, you don't need a separate declaration of the variable. So you can put the put the type declaration there. Um, so whether or not you have that type declaration there, the loop indices, the uh, oh the yeah, the loop indices, the, the variables here, are separate from the variable in out, outside of the do loop. So uh, you can't you can't like you know have a do concurrent loop run and then expect i to have any particular value. Um, nor can you expect i to have any particular value on entry, but that's kind of that's normal do loop stuff anyway. Um, but they're, the standard says that they're technically different entities. Um, then the syntax for uh, specifying the loop bounds is actually slightly different. It's a colon instead of a comma, and that is partially to, to uh, allow for multiple loop indices in a single uh, do loop. So you can have multiple loop indices that it's basically a way of kind of collapsing multiple loops together. Another interesting aspect of do concurrent is that you can have this uh, mask expression. So what the and this can be in terms of the loop indices. So basically, you can say that um, I only want to run these loops for cases where this expression is true. So this allows you to also kind of pull out uh, one level of like if statement. So if like if there are certain indices that you're just going to skip in a loop. You can use this expression, and it says ahead of time, like, "Hey, these are the these are the situations where I don't want you to execute the body of the loop." Uh, and so that that appears as the the last the last piece in uh, the do concurrent, and and it's optional. Um, then after the parentheses. There are a couple of extra clauses that you can stick on uh, to affect behavior of different variables that are used inside the loop. Uh, the default none says that n there is no kind of default behavior for a variable. So uh, this is, I, I kind of make an analogy to implicit none, but so default none says that like every variable that you're gonna reference inside of this, this loop uh, better have appeared in one of these uh, clauses. Local says that there is a separate copy of this variable for any, every iteration of the loop, meaning uh, it's not, it doesn't initially have any value and no, no, val no iteration can see what the value is for any other iteration. Local init says the same type of thing except that the variable will start every iteration of the loop with the same value that the outside variable had on entry to the loop. 
I don't I don't really ever have much use for that type of a of a of a construct, but it, it is there. Um, so what that what that does is it says like every iteration will start with this value, but you also you also can modify this, and no no other iteration will see that modification. Um, typically, I'd use something like shared, and then not change the variable inside the body of the loop, because that that's the kind of thing that you might have an existing do loop and and be doing where it's like I'll, I'll have set some stuff up then we'll get to this loop and i'll be referring to one of those one of the variables but i'm not going to change it because i want every every iteration of that loop to be using the same value there but i rarely would you see something uh for, where you're converting from a uh a regular do loop to a do concurrent and, and then have use for local init. Uh, but shared says uh, basically every every iteration of the loop can see this variable. You are not then allowed to change it. And so the way the the way the uh, the way the standard is written is that variables which are shared cannot be modified in any iteration variables what which do not appear in any of these and if there's if there's no default none then any variable that is modified that is defined in what iteration shall not be referenced or defined in any other iteration so the basic rules of the language are, are such that a, for a lot of cases, the compiler can kind of check you to make sure you didn't write something where the iterations depend on one another, because that is what this construct is saying is like, none of the iterations of this loop depend on any other iteration in the loop. And so there are some additional rules that kind of help enforce that. With the one exception is the reduce clause says that every iteration of the loop will start with the variable having the value on entry. So similar to local init, but you're allowed to make very specific updates to that variable. And then it, on completion of the loop, those will be all of those uh, modifications will be combined so you can write something like a parallel summation. And we'll look at a couple of examples. Um, so the restrictions on do concurrent, there can be no dependence between iterations. You, this is telling the compiler that like, hey, this ought to be able to be done in parallel. Well, if there are dependence between iterations, well, then you can't do it in parallel. So that's just kind of number one rule. There are a lot of ways that the compiler can check you. Not every possible way that you could violate that rule can be checked at compile time. Um, so it's kind of on, on the user to, to write code that doesn't have any dependence between iterations. Call, you can only call pure procedures in the body of a do concurrent loop. Um, and pure procedures are not allowed to modify module or host associated, like they can't modify state. They're allowed to refer to it, but they can't modify it. And they can't do IO. Technically, you are allowed to have explicit IO statements in the body of the loop. So you can have print statements and write statements, but it's generally best to avoid it anyway, because the order of those outputs or inputs, if you've got read statements, the order of those things is undefined. So it might just come out in a weird order. Um, some of the best practices for do concurrent use default none. This is kind of along the, the lines of everybody's agreed that you should have implicit none everywhere in Fortran, right? You shouldn't have implicit typing for variables. 
you probably shouldn't have uh, implicit, uh, you know, shared or local uh, for for variables that you're referencing in a do concurrent. Um, shared for variables that are referenced but not modified. So if you've got some some very some local variable that you've set up before the loop and you want every iteration to refer to it, you can use shared. Local for variables that are going to hold intermediate results, um, but make sure that you define them before you use them so that every iteration, you know, it's got to it's got to define that variable before it can reference it because it is technically undefined at the beginning of iteration of your every iteration. Local init for variables that should start every iteration with the value that it had when we arrived at the loop. Again, I don't have many use cases for this, uh, but I, I think it was probably added because there is a similar aspect of OpenMP. So, um, so it is available if, if you ever have a use case for it. Um, Use shared and guard with uh, an i equals some particular value for variables that are going to be used after the loop, right? So, if if there is some some state where you want to you've gone gone through this loop and there's one particular value that you want to save for use after the loop, uh, put that variable in the shared clause, but make sure you only assign to it in the like one particular iteration that. It, that has the value that you want and then use reduce for variables that accumulate right so if you've got something like x equals x plus one uh, you'll use like uh, the reduce clause will say reduce parentheses plus colon x and that says that you're allowed to increment x with the plus operator and that will help that will do that if if it that loop runs in parallel, every iteration will start with x equals whatever it had before the loop started, and then upon completion of the loop, it will take all of the intermediate results and combine them using the same operator. That, that allows it to do uh, reduction operations. So let's take a look at some examples that kind of illustrate how you can use do concurrent. So done with the vector examples. Let's start off with something like hello world, right? So let's let's start by just looking at a simple uh, serial hello world program. You know, we're just print hello world um, modulo and pray, make sure that that's that I'm using the right compiler. Hello, um, let's uh, cd into that directory. TN hello serial.f90 hello serial.exe and run the program. And of course, hello world, right? All right, so we're talking about do concurrent. So, what does a hello world look like for do concurrent? Well, let's print hello world multiple times. So we'll have uh, a do concurrent loop. Uh, we'll just do it 10 times and we'll say which iteration are we on when, when we print hello. If you want the Cray compiler to actually use multiple threads for do concurrent loops, there's an extra option to add dash H thread do concurrent. Uh, there are other compilers have similar flags. A lot of other compilers have similar flags. That's just, this is the one for the Cray compiler. So let's try that out. Thread do concurrent. Hello do concurrent. Dot exe. And then when we run it, you'll see that some of them are out of order. So one and two, five and six, seven and eight, nine and 10, and three and four, right? So this di it did actually run some iterations of the loop in parallel. And so you get out of order uh, output. Like I said, this is, this is one of the reasons that you can usually want to just kind of avoid IO or output 
in do concurrent because the order is not defined. Um, my, I believe that um, the Cray compiler uses OpenMP under the hood to implement threaded do concurrent. So my understanding is that if you set the environment variable, you can get it to use a specific number of threads. So if so, like if I say only use one thread, well, I'll probably get in order execution. So that that's kind of the simplest example of you know what's what's a way to use do concurrent. The next kind of um, standard example that people use for for demonstrating various aspects of uh, parallelism in a language like Fortran is a matrix multiplication. So we've got uh, a little example here that just does a matrix. Uh, has a matrix multiply procedure. Uh, let's look at the serial version first. So your standard matrix multiplication where we've got two arrays or two matrices A and B that will take as input and a matrix C that will provide as output. Um, I use assumed shape because uh, and I always I always tell people this when I'm teaching Fortran assumed size or explicit size does not get checked by the compiler so um, putting putting n m and and o or you know what, whatever you wanted to for you know what are the size of these arrays the compiler does not actually check that those sizes match and weird things happen, especially with multi-dimensional arrays, because of something called uh, element order storage sequence association. Um, if the if your bounds don't actually match, the the elements that you're accessing inside of a procedure may not have really much correlation at all to the elements you're accessing outside of the procedure if they don't match. So it just gets really confusing. I just say use assumed shape because the bounds get inherited and then you can check them. So uh, we just got some a simple sanity check here to, you know, make, make sure that our matrices have, have uh, the sizes necessary so that you can actually do matrix multiplication. Um, initially set all of the elements of the output matrix to zero. Then loop over i, j, and k, which are the sizes of a in the first dimension, b in the second dimension, and then a in the second dimension, respectively. And then, of course, you know, we've all seen a matrix multiplication and implementation at this point, probably. So uh, let's cd into the matrix multiply folder ftn let's see i've got yeah it's just serial serial compile and execute and as you know just a sanity check i'm going to print out the matrix but we're just going to generate two uh, random matrices and then do the multiply and as just a sanity check yeah, all, all of the values after doing a matrix, the matrix multiplication ought to be between 0 and 1 because all of the numbers we generated for the matrices are between 0 and 1. That's, that's what the random number subroutine does. Um, so just as a sanity check to make sure we have a functioning matrix multiplication implementation. Um, so that doesn't take very long because we didn't do a very big matrix. Um, but if you start to get very big, say make them 10, 12, 14. Right, and I've and I've got these matrices defined such that they'll be consistent with those. 
Oh, and uh, if we want to get more realistic timings, um, you can do that matrix multiplication more than multiple times. So let's do that like 10 times to see, you know, how long does each, how, how long does that take? Um, recompile and yeah, you can see we're, we're getting sane values for having that many numbers added together. And it took, you know, one tenth of a millisecond, one or two tenths of a millisecond. Okay, so so that's what it will look like in serial to do a, a matrix multiplication. So how do we get an implementation that does that in parallel with do concurrent? So we won't we won't need to change anything in the main program, but just for comparison's sake, I'll go ahead and use the same uh, sizes. So that way we ought to get a matrix that looks similar, have similar values. Um, so we're not gonna change anything about the main program. We've still just got matrices, generate random values to stick into the matrices and do a multiplication. The implementation, we'll still do our sanity checks. We'll set the values of the matrix, the output matrix to zero initially. And this is where we can combine all of those loops into a single, single do concurrent loop. I goes from one to the size of A1, J goes from one to the size of B2, and K goes from one to the size of A in the second dimension. All right. Now we say we're going to do a reduction on C with the plus operator. And we just have the exact same implementation of the loop body. We've just been able to collapse from three loops down to one loop and just specify uh, the loop bounds all in one statement. Again, to do uh, threaded, we use that command. And then do concurrent. And we get what looks like uh, about the same answer. And that one actually went slower. Let's see if it goes any faster. So that went 9e e to the minus 3, 6e e to the minus 3. So it goes a little bit, it seems to go with those matrix sizes, maybe a little faster when we do it in serial. Let's see what happens if we do some big matrices. So big matrix takes eight point something in with one thread and two point. Uh, so this is probably generating uh, a naive implementation in terms of memory accesses would be my guess. So, um, but you can, you know, play around with different size matrices and, and see if this does in fact go faster. Um, let's see. I want to say I was able to do some pretty big matrices when I was first putting things together and testing. So let's see. How long those take? Okay. 
of course, output takes as long as anything. Let me... Oh, there it goes. Two and a half seconds with four threads. And with eight threads. Three seconds. So, so this is probably not the ideal way to implement a matrix multiplication. Um, so, this this is one of those aspects of parallel programming where just doing things in parallel doesn't always make it go faster because there are other idiosyncrasies of the machine that that matter. Uh, one of the biggest ones is like memory access. So it having to do with caches. Um, so the the CPU has what's called a cache where it's got it's got regions on basically on the CPU where it's got some storage for you know, intermediate um, operations so it doesn't have to go all the way back out to main memory to get uh, to get values and uh, yeah best practice is to use a tuned library like blahs yeah you know there there are a whole bunch of uh, there's a handful of linear algebra libraries out there if you're doing matrix math and linear algebra yeah you use a library that's been tuned for this stuff a lot of times they're even tuned like per machine you know, there, there's a lot of tuning that can be done for the general matrix type operations. They have figured out what works best for various machines and, and, and things like that. Um, but generally, any algorithm, any algorithm, any problem that you're trying to solve, there are going to be some aspects where um, just trying to do more than one thing at a time won't necessarily make things faster. Towards the beginning, when I was talking about overheads, um, that's a big part of it. If if there is a lot of stuff going on that can add to the overhead of doing things in parallel, and the amount of work you have to do isn't all that big, then trying to do things in parallel can actually go slower. And this is one this is one example of something like that. So. Let's see, are there any questions on do concurrent? And I'm happy to, let's see, how similar is Cray Fortran to, okay, so yeah, Cray Fortran is a compiler that implements Fortran. Uh, I believe they claim to be fully Fortran 2018 compliant. So they support all of the features of the Fortran 2018 standard. Fortran is, with very rare exception, completely backwards compatible. A Fortran 77 program is a standards compliant Fortran 2018 program. That said, if you're using features from the newer standards, there are occasions where some compilers may not have support for the newer features. So ask, asking whether uh, Cray CCE Fortran uh, is similar to Fortran 90 or Fortran 2018 is like asking whether uh, a Ford F-150 is similar to a pickup truck, <laughs> right? It's, yes, yeah, Ford, Ford is a pickup truck. The, the F-150 is a pickup truck, but so Cray CCE is a Fortran compiler. Will code with a do concurrent compile without the thread do concurrent? Uh, it will still compile. 
Um, yeah, we can. I can demonstrate. Right. Compile command. You can take off the option. Yes, it still compiles. Yes, it still runs. It will take. Um, it will probably take about the same amount of time as when I ran it with just a single thread. So probably that two and a half seconds. Give or take if the machine's busy with other things too. Ah, yeah, there you go, 0.3 seconds, right? So the overhead of dealing with parallel execution clearly is not, says that this is not the right algorithm for doing it, for doing a matrix multiply. So um, yeah, if you, if you don't add that option, I think all of the compilers right now just default to serial execution as if you had written regular do loops. Um, but uh, I know Cray has an option. Um, pretty sure NVIDIA has an option. I think G4Tran has an option. I think, I, yeah. Um, and Intel might as well. Yeah, Intel must have one. Um, yeah, most of, most of the big... Um, vendor compilers have options to turn on automatic parallelization of do concurrent that was that was kind of the whole reason it was added to the language it was like we want we want something that says the compiler is allowed to optimize uh, to do this stuff in parallel it does not say that it has to do some compilers use openmp under the hood yes I am relatively sure that Cray is using OpenMP under the hood. I'm pretty sure, like 90% sure that G4Tran uses OpenMP under the hood. I, I believe that NVIDIA uses OpenACC under the hood. And I'm not sure about Intel. I would, Intel used OpenMP under the hood. Okay. That would that would make sense because yeah because Intel does not support OpenACC but um, it's the compiler is really allowed to use whatever technology they want under the hood but since you know a lot of the compilers already had support for OpenMP it's kind of kind of a no brainer to just oh well we'll just pretend that it looks like OpenMP. Um, I've been getting the following error message when trying to compile. Syntax error in do statement. Didn't modify anything but the variables that set the matrix. I would have to see the other bits of the code. Um, because unless maybe you have more than one end do, but only a single do concurrent statement. Yeah, because with do concurrent, you can have three different loop indice variables. Uh, you only need, you still only need one end do. So that might explain that one. Can you explain a bit more about the reduce clause used in the do concurrent example of matrix? multiplication. I can't visualize the operation here in my mind. Yeah. So let's just kind of work out the the example here, um, assuming a two by two. I'll just kind of use right here as like some scratch space. So we're going to set all of C to zero to start with, right? So then for i, j, and k equal one, we'll have c one, one equal to c one, one plus a one, one times b one, one, right? Then we'll do, uh, let's increment i first, right? So I2, J1, C of 
to 1 plus a of 2 1 times b of 2 1. All right, so we're just kind of like manually unrolling the loop here. So do concurrent says that I could have done either of these op I could do either of these operations in either order or in parallel. But so let's get to I equal one, J equal one, K equal two. Right? So now we've got I equal one, K equal two. Right. So just like I said, those other two could have been done in either order. These can be done in either order. But we have a race condition. Both of these statements are looking at and then assigning to C1, comma 1. But there are plenty of algorithms out there that know how to coordinate this and do these reduction operations with some parallelism involved. Reduce is saying, hey, that's what I want to happen. So what it's gonna what this is really saying is that both of these are equivalent to that during execution of the loop. The, so uh, one, of the ex, one of the extra rules when you say reduce is that the only way that you're allowed to modify that variable is if it appears as one of the operands for that operator. Right, so it can appear in either the left or the right hand side of the, the plus sign. But that is the only way that you're allowed to modify it is if it appears in something as a in an expression like this, where it's like, I'm gonna set this equal to itself plus something. And you can use plus, minus, times, divide, min, max, and I think that's it. There, there's a list in the standard that says what it, what can you use for the operator here? Um, and so this is the only way that you're allowed to, opt to, to do those modifications. And what the standard says is that it's as if every iteration starts with the value of the variable being equal to what it was before the start of the loop. And then on completion of all iterations, that reduction happens. Now, whether the compiler generates code that actually does it exactly that way and has temporary storage for every iteration or whatever, it's probably unlikely to do it that way. But the standard says that, the standard generally says stuff about, stuff like that, as if. So, if the compiler knows how to not necessarily, you know, generate temporary storage and then do the reduction after, it's allowed to. So long as you wouldn't really be able to tell whether it did that or not. So if you had a print statement in here, you probably would see that it doesn't actually implement it that way. It's probably you'll probably see intermediate values of C when it actually does run the loop, but um, it it might it doesn't have to, right? And so the reduction operation is basically just making this valid and saying that's supposed to work, because without this, you're now modifying. Uh, you've got loop dependencies, right? You're, you're modifying a variable and looking at it in more than one iteration. And so then it's, 
it's undefined what the order is so you don't know which what it will be when and if it's trying to do things in parallel you're going to have collisions because it's going to read the value do a calculation and then store the value while another thread is doing the same thing you'll get collisions and you'll get the wrong answer so hopefully that kind of uh, helps explain it a bit more um, from the syntax, it looks as if I can do com parallel programming without op without MPI or OpenMP. Yes, that's exactly the point, is that do concurrent lets you do parallel programming without having to use OpenMP. Right? It lets you do shared memory pro parallel programming without having to use OpenMP, at least um, to a subset of what you can do with OpenMP. There are more things that you can do with OpenMP that you can't quite do with Do Concurrent, um, but Do Concurrent gets you pretty far from what your your typical uh, simple use cases might be. So, let's see. I'll just go ahead and answer that one. Yes. Anything else? Well, if not, we'll go back to the slides and talk a bit about OpenMP. So so do concurrent was kind of a, a reduced subset of like saying, hey, I've got a loop. The iterations don't depend on each other. You could do this in parallel. It's a way of expressing in Fortran that, that, um, that property of your code. The OpenMP kind of goes to a whole level of defining a parallel execution model. So this is what's... Um, this is what is termed a parallel programming model. And the OpenMP model is that we, we can dynamically spawn threads and then join. And those threads can do independent things. So it's called fork join. Um, there are different ways of defining the parallel regions and tasks. Um, and then OpenMP, the syntax also some supports some direct um, like SIMD directives and some hierarchical task models. Um, that stuff's kind of more advanced and outside the scope of this training session. But you can kind of think of it this way is, you know, you've got a program, it's single threaded, it, it's executing one, one thread, just doing serial execution. It gets to some point in the program and it says, okay, I've got a bunch of things that can be done in parallel. It tells the operating system, please spawn this many tasks, and I've got these things for those tasks to do. Um, there's, there's a bit more to it um, in the actual implementation, but that, that's about the gist of it. It's like, we get here, we've got, we know we've got some parallel, some things that can be done in parallel. Let's figure out how to actually execute those things in parallel when all those things are done will go back to serial execution. And you can do that multiple times throughout the execution of a program um, uh, so that you, at different points, maybe you have different number of threads that you'll spawn, um, you have different numbers of uh, tasks for the different threads, but um, that, that's the idea is we'll have, we'll do some serial execution, then we'll spawn threads and do parallel execution, and then come back together and do serial execution, yada, yada. Um, the OpenMP syntax. So OpenMP is kind of an, is more like an extension to, to various languages. It's not really defined by the language, the languages themselves. So the Fortran standard says nothing about OpenMP. It's an extension to the language. And the way you use it is something that looks like a comment to normal Fortran compilers. Like, so if a Fortran compiler just doesn't understand OpenMP, doesn't, doesn't support it, it's just gonna, it, 
the directives start with a, an exclamation point. So as far as those compilers are concerned, that's just a comment. But to a Fortran compiler that understands OpenMP, it sees this as a special looking comment and then knows what to do about that. Um, so OpenMP in Fortran, it starts with exclamation point dollar sign OMP, and then there are a whole host of different, they're called directives, that are defined by the OpenMP specification, and you can learn all about them at the openmp.org slash specifications page, um, and then uh, some of those directives in Fortran require an explicit end. So say uh, you can define parallel regions and then you'll need a, an end to say where the end of the parallel region is. For some of those directives, um, they're kind of explicitly uh, with respect to a specific block of code. And so that end might be optional. Uh, for example, a parallel do, it knows that the end of that parallel do is the end do statement. So you don't really need the extra OpenMP directive to, to specify the end of that. Um, so, but like I, like I say on the slide, we're mostly just going to focus on parallel do for this training. So the syntax for OpenMP parallel do, like I said, starts with that uh, exclamation dollar sign OMP. Parallel, so that says this is going to be a section of code that we want to do parallel execution on. Do, oh, we, we want it to apply to this do loop. And then there's a whole bunch of extra clauses. Um, collapse, oops, back up. So collapse allows you to have regular do loops that function like we just saw with do concurrent. I've got do i equals, do j equals, do k equals. I can say, I want you to put those things together. So you can write regular old Fortran do loops, and then OpenMP can know how to put those together, just like we were able to actually specify with do concurrent. Shared has a very similar meaning to the shared clause for do concurrent. There, I think there's a couple of nuances that are subtly different, but for the most part, it's, it's uh, pretty similar. Private is like the local clause in do concurrent, meaning uh, every, every iteration is going to have its own copy of this variable. First private is like that local init. Um, where every iteration is going to get its own copy that starts with the value that it had before we entered this section of the of the of code, this parallel block. Last private says that the last iteration will be saved in the the outer variable, right? So every every iteration is going to get its own copy, but the last one is we're going to we're going to promise that the last iteration is what will be stored in that variable when we're done. And then the reduction is just like reduce for do concurrent. This is like, hey, we're gonna we're gonna be accumulating into this variable. Um, so make sure that that works correctly. So very similar type structure and syntax to do concurrent. Uh, best practices use shared for variables that are referenced but not modified within the loop, right? So if you do some setup code and then you want to re refer to those variables in the body of the loop, the markup is shared. Private for variables that hold intermediate results and make sure to define them before using them. So these are basically the same rules as we had for do concurrent. First private, uh, last private. Um, so do concurrent didn't have an equivalent for last private. Um, you could, you could in theory, uh, manually write some code that would mimic last private, but it's a little bit trickier. OpenMP just has a way to, to say that that's something that you want done. And then reduction variables, uh, reductions work 
pretty much exactly the same. One of the other best practices is do not write code that assumes or requires a specific number of threads. Uh, do concurrent really doesn't have any way, you know, the Fortran doesn't really have any way of saying, are we going to be using threads or not? Uh, do concurrent has no way of indicating whether we're executing in parallel or not. So there's really no way to write regular Fortran code and do concurrent loops that would require a specific number of threads. OpenMP has a variety of kind of library functions that you can call. So they look like regular Fortran functions. Uh, you'll have like a use OMP uh, statement somewhere, and then you can call some of these functions that let you kind of inquire about how many threads are executing right now and uh, which thread am I and a couple of other things. But best practice is not to write code that assumes or requires specific numbers of threads because you as the programmer don't know how it's going to be run. And that's not particularly nice to your users who think, well, if I just change the OMP num threads environment variable when I run it from 8 to 16, it should go twice as fast, right? Well, if you wrote code that assumed that it was always going to be run with eight threads, well, now that's not going to work. Um, so it's usually best practice to just not assume that, don't assume that you're going to be running in parallel, let alone how many number of threads you're going to have. So let's look at those couple of examples for OpenMP. So let's go back to our hello world example. So, you know, our, our regular old hello world that we had before. Um, so what does that look like if we want to you know, try out something, try out OpenMP? So, We've added a do loop, so we're gonna, you know, have it have some iterations. Uh, we'll say hello on iteration i, just like we did with do concurrent. We we know what iteration we're gonna be on. Um, with OpenMP, like I said, there's there are a handful of, uh, of functions in the uh, OpenMP library that if you're using OpenMP, you can call. Uh, OMP get thread num is one of them. It will tell you which thread am I, numbered one to however many there are, zero to one minus however many threads there are at that point. Um, so if you are using OpenMP, you add the dash, o, dash H OMP flag for the Cray compiler. Uh, G Fortran, it's dash F open MP, I think. Uh, I think it's the same for NV Fortran. Intel, I think it's dash Q open MP. I don't remember them all right off the top of my head, but most compilers that support open MP have a, a flag that's similar. I think dash F open MP even works with the Cray compiler, but. Anyway, um, so hello OpenMP. So that will compile and we can run it. And now you'll see by default, we're getting four threads, five threads for this loop. Probably it's the compiler going, oh, I see how many iterations you're gonna have. I have a pretty decent idea of how how long this loop is going to take, I bet if we did five threads, that would be about right. Um, I think, OMP num threads equal four will it's still doing five threads because I missed an O. There we go. So now we get four. All right, and you'll see that it split it up one, two, three to thread zero, four, five, six to thread one, seven, eight, nine to thread two, and 10 to thread three. 
So if it doesn't divide evenly, uh, you'll end up with some threads that and that uh, take longer than others probably as well. Um, if we set it to 10, then it's allowed to, right? So uh, requested total thread count over subscription. Right, so when I started this S alloc uh, session, I said uh, N8. So I'm going to have eight tasks. Um, so I've only got eight cores, and it's telling me, hey, you've asked for 10, 10 OpenMP threads, uh, but you've only got eight cores. So it's yelling at me. It's going to warn me about that. Um, but it did still actually uh, use 10 threads. You are allowed to do this, uh, and then you may or may not see some performance benefits to doing that. Um, if you have a very heavily memory bound program where there's a lot of memory accesses going on, sometimes you can get work done while memory is being transferred. And so sometimes uh, using more threads than you have cores can be beneficial. Sometimes that's a terrible idea because the fact that one core starts to, one thread starts to execute in between another thread means that the memory access actually happens out of order and then you're doing way more memory accesses than you than ought to be happening and it can actually go slower. So it, it's a case by case basis on that one. Um, right, so we so we can actually ask, you know, what what thread are we so you could in theory do different things on different threads but like i said best practice is not to make assumptions that there will be any specific number of threads um, the other thing is what happens if we try and compile this program without the openmp flag Uh, we get a warning, contains OpenMP directives, but we didn't specify it. Um, so just the one warning. And then what happens when we execute it? Uh, did we not get an executable? Why not? What's going on? Why did we not get an executable? That's weird. Ah, the, yes, there we go. There's the there's the error. Uh, so when we go to do the linking. Uh, Undefined reference to OpenMP get get thread num. So, uh, if we want, we can we can get this to compile by commenting out the use of the special OpenMP stuff. Right, and then that will so in this form this will compile without the OpenMP flag, and it just won't, won't run multiple threads. If we add the, the OpenMP flag, it will compile and should run. Yeah, there we go. There you get out of order execution evidence that it is running multiple threads, right? So a lot of OpenMP programs can be compiled with or without. Could you use CPP-like directives? Yes, yeah, I'll, I've seen plenty of OpenMP code do that, right? Where you're wanting to look at a uh, number of threads or uh, stuff like that, or use OpenMP, yeah, uh, most compilers, I'd have, I don't do a whole lot of OpenMP programming, so I'm not certain but I think that's probably a standard uh, define 
for whether OpenMP is in use or not. So, but yeah, you could you can use if defs to to comment out the spe the special stuff. But like I said, this when you're not using OpenMP, this is just treated like a regular old uh, comment because it starts with an exclamation point. So. What about the matrix multiplication example? So what does that look like? So the main program looks just like it did for the serial and do concurrent versions. We've got some arrays. We'll uh, just put fill them with random values and do a matrix multiply. So then the implementation of matrix multiply looks almost identical to the serial version with a single extra directive. Uh, parallel do. I've got three loops. All of these iterations are in, all of the iterations of all of these loops combined are independent. So we can say collapse three. That's saying take the next three loops and put them together. And then reduction where we're, we're, we're uh, Incrementing C. So um, matrix multiply. Um, let's grab the same sizes as we were using for the do concurrent and see if OpenMP goes any faster. All right, where's our so we compile it like this. And then run it. And wait a couple of seconds. And then we see a whole bunch of output that all look like values in a, about the right range. Um, now it took 17 seconds. So let's actually drop these down and recompile and we'll use all our threads and that takes 266 milliseconds or no 26 milliseconds um, and what if we use one thread 13, 134 milliseconds. Okay. So let's compile the serial version. And let's see, we already compiled it, right? So what happens when we run the serial version? It takes, uh, we probably need to add some zeros here. There we go. Now that, now that should be the same. Yeah, so the serial version goes faster than the OpenMP version, even when we're only using one thread for the OpenMP version. <laughs> but what happens if we compile the OpenMP version without the OpenMP flag? We get the warning saying, hey, the compiler saw some OpenMP directives, but you didn't so specify the flag. Now it is identical to the serial version as far as the compiler is concerned. So once again, that's the example of like, that. that is one of the benefits of OpenMP is it probably still is at least really close to standards conforming Fortran, 
without the OpenMP directives. Uh, if the code used collapse two, would it collapse the outer two or the inner two? It's the outer two. So it says the next two. If you wanted to collapse the inner ones, you would move it in. So, um, and yeah, this is, that is actually uh, an aspect that you can kind of play around with in terms of trying to figure out what's the most efficient way of parallelizing things. If you've got nested loops like this, Sometimes it might be beneficial to parallelize the outer two, but have the inner one run serially or parallelize the inner two with the outer one running in serial. Um, yeah, you can play around with different aspects of that, of like what, what, in what way do I want to parallelize which of these loops? The do concurrent, um, the compiler could decide. I don't know if any of them are smart enough to try and work out like, hey, should I do, you know, I serially and J and K in parallel. I, I don't know that any of them are actually trying to figure that sort of thing out. But in theory, uh, like I said, the, the standard doesn't say what the method of parallelization of do concurrent is, or even if it's parallel at all, or what iterations are run in parallel. So in theory, it could do some smart things. I think that's a really hard problem and nobody's really trying to solve it yet, but uh, in theory it's possible. Okay, so we've looked at do concurrent and OpenMP. Uh, let's see, are there any other questions in the doc? Is there a subroutine inside, if there is a subroutine inside do loop, do those variables need to be included in private as well? So for, for OpenMP or, I, so I don't think the answer really matters whether we're talking about OpenMP or do concurrent, but, um, you with OpenMP the that you know pure, only call pure procedures is not a thing that the compiler will warn you about, and so if you do have subroutines or functions that you're calling inside of the the loop, the compiler's not going to warn you about it. If those procedures are modifying state. So it's a bit easier to inadvertently write buggy OpenMP code. Because usually what you see people doing is, hey, I've got this serial code. I think these loops could be done in parallel. I'll just slap an OpenMP directive on, on right on top of the loop. And then lo and behold, it runs in parallel. But I get the wrong answer now. <laughs> um, because a lot, there's a lot of OpenMP, or there's a lot of Fortran code out there that there's a lot of stuff that isn't being passed as arguments to procedures. If it's passed as an argument, you kind of got a visual indication of like, hey, there's something going toward, going to this procedure. You probably want to add it to one of the clauses, either local or private or, uh, or you know, first private or shared or whatever it is. If there's a, if there's an argument there, you you can kind of see that there's a variable being passed. I recommend if you're using OpenMP, at least in in principle, you should be using pure procedures. Do concurrent. The compiler will enforce that. If you're calling a procedure, it has to be pure. OpenMP won't enforce that, but you probably want that semantic in principle when you're writing OpenMP code because that that's the place that bugs creep in. Are there any reasons why the Cray compiler is used for these examples? Um, mostly I knew that the Cray compiler would work for all of the examples that we're looking at over the course of the training session. Um, the Cray compiler supports OpenMP 
parallel execution of do concurrent, MPI, and coarrays, and that's pretty much the only compiler that does. Um, G4Tran does, but uh, I hit a couple of bugs when I was trying to write some of the some of the examples. Um, if you're using like one or the other, uh, there there are other compile the other compilers will work depending on which specific feature you want to use, even a co combination. Like there are plenty of people who use G4Tran with OpenMP and MPI, and it works just fine. I just hit a couple of bugs when I was trying to use G4Tran in one of the examples. And so I just said, well, I know the Cray compiler works and I got it working with all of the examples. Seems the GitHub repo does not have any readme file for instructions on how to compile link run, submit the codes on Perlmutter. Uh, the .f90 file, yeah, the .f90 files have a compile command at the top. Um, the, pro, the nurse documentation has instructions for submitting jobs on Perlmutter. Comment on line 26 in do concurrent. Okay. Do concurrent line sanity check. Ah, yeah. So. An optimizing compiler, like the Cray compiler generally has on by default, can sometimes notice that C is an intent out variable. And if you never do anything with it, right, so A and B are intent in, C is intent out. You can see that there are no side effects because this is pure. If C is then never used, the compiler can notice and go, I don't have to do this at all. You don't need the answer to this. Running this procedure doesn't do anything. Then I don't need to run this procedure at all. And it could optimize the whole thing away. Um, also, we do kind of want some sanity check that our calculations look like they're right. <laughs> So that looks like most of those questions and feel free to unmute and ask questions as well. So if there are any other questions on OpenMP or do concurrent specifically, I think we'll go ahead and start looking at the real world examples. Uh, so the first example, uh, we'll look at the serial version to start with. Uh, this is an example of some code that will calculate the area of the Mandelbrot set. Uh, there was a there was a post on the Fortran Lang discourse, and I think the original version was uh, written to use open or use MPI. Uh, and I went, hey, I need examples for the thing I'm about to teach. Uh, can I borrow that? So they said, yeah. So uh, basically, this is going. This will calculate. This code will calculate the area of the Mandelbrot set via kind of brute force integration. Basically, um, it's going to you know check whether or not a point. Uh, so this would be like, and if anybody knows whether I'm saying anything quite incorrectly, go ahead and pipe up and correct me. But I, 
this is kind of in the ballpark of a like a Monte Carlo method for calculating the area of a of a shape where we're gonna we're just gonna blanket the area with uh, with sample we're just gonna sample this area and then determine whether or not it's inside or outside of the shape and then the area of the shape is the ratio is the ratio of the rectangular area that we know the area of that we sampled and how many how many points were inside the the shape versus outside the shape and so the Mandelbrot set is uh, basically just you know does does this can does this uh, equational form converge so if it uh, if it diverges then it wasn't in the Mandelbrot set and if it does and if we don't find that it diverges we assume it converged and uh, that it was in the Mandelbrot set and so if it was in the set then we'll increment and then at the end we know how many points we're sampling so we know what that ratio is so that's that's the basic uh, algorithm here is uh, loop over uh, number of points uh, so a rectangular area that is um, I I didn't check this but my guess is this is a the rectangular area that is not the repeat that doesn't include the repeated uh, shapes so we're kind of getting you know one period of the Mandelbrot set and so we're just gonna do a whole bunch of sampling in there and determine what the what the area is so Mandelbrot area so for the serial version serial serial and we'll run it and this takes a decent chunk of time because we are doing 2 to the 12 which is oh, now I have to double check four thousand iterations times half of that so two thousand so we're doing eight million points that we're going to sample and then we're also going to do a you know eighth of that so 500 attempts to check whether it's going to converge so you know potentially potentially like 40 billion calculations uh, but then uh, we can figure out that the area was that's the area we calculated um, this was the kind of accepted answer uh, for reference and we can see that we're we're within you know three four decimal places uh, two decimal places anyway with the serial version if we do if we do that many iterations okay so what would this look like if we were going to do do a transformation to do a do concurrent here so for do con for do concurrent the iterations have to be independent you can see here that we're actually sharing this value in this loop in the grand scheme of things this is not a particularly expensive calculation relative to our test of is this going to be in the set or not so 
when I transform it to do concurrent, I just live with the fact that we're going to be redoing this calculation more than we really need to. You could have two different do concurrent loops. That would be fine as well. It just gets more complicated. Um, so this was my transformation of it. We're going to go i equals 1 to n, just like in the serial calculation. j equals 1 to n over 2, just like in the serial calculation. The real part and the imaginary part are local variables. We're going to recalculate it for every single iteration. And we're doing a reduction over the area. Um, cycle does not work in do concurrent. That would because that would imply um, loop dependence. And not, I exit does not work either because that would imply that would definitely imply a loop dependence because am I supposed to Am I supposed to execute this iteration or not? Depends on a previous iteration. <laughs> so, uh, so we get rid of the cycle by just saying by uh, inverting the conditional here and just putting it in an if then. So if we now compile that with, uh, let's just copy paste the. Command. Current. Concurrent. And with the same number of iterations, we should get the same answer and we actually get a different answer hmm well that's interesting what happens if we run one thread Seems like it takes longer. And we get the original answer. Hmm. So something about running in parallel is getting a slightly different answer. Ah, yeah. So yeah, that, that would be somewhat expected. Because floating point operations are not actually commutative or associative. Yeah, associative, the way you might think. So if I've got a really big number and a really small number, there's a range of uh, precision that we can actually represent. And so if we add together the small numbers before adding on the big number, we'll get a different answer than if we start with the big number and incrementally add smaller numbers, because sometimes the smaller numbers will drop a decent fraction of their significant digits because it's not, we can only represent so many significant digits and if I've got a billion plus one billionth, well, I can't, if I've only got, you know, nine significant digits that I can store, that billionth is outside of the number of significant digits I can store. I don't want to, I don't want to lose that I've got a billion, so we just drop the billionth. But, uh, so if you do do the additions out of order, you might get a slightly different answer.
So that's not unexpected. But if we time these, we'll see how long it takes to do it in serial and then with eight threads. So 28 seconds to do it in serial. In theory, you could do it in an eighth of the time with eight threads, but, oh, I forgot to, that's not right. here. There we go. Takes... Gets harder to read the output from time. Uh, eight seconds? Yeah. So, a fourth, right, so there, there you're seeing some of the overheads of parallel execution are, are coming into play. So that that's the way I would transform this to use do concurrent. You will note, cannot do this loop in parallel because at every iteration we're going to determine whether or not we're going to return so each iteration actually depends on the previous iteration. So this loop cannot be done in parallel. What about the OpenMP example? Again, I, I decided it was probably worthwhile to just re, redo the calculation for the real part for every iteration so that we could do a parallel do collapse two private for real and imaginary production over area so basically looks very similar to the do concurrent version that loop is i or that loop body is identical to that one it's just a matter of how many lines does it take to say that whether we want to do it in parallel but we can Compile it, P, and then P, and see how long that one takes. similar amount of time as do concurrent. So being as the loops look nearly identical, that's kind of what you would expect is that it's probably just, the compiler is probably rewrite, rewriting that do concurrent to be like that. And then just using its OpenMP, uh, its OpenMP implementation to just do this. That that's kind of what I would expect. So that's the Mandelbrot area realish world example. So there's some code to play with for trying out do concurrent and OpenMP. Um, now, what are we looking at for the burger solver? So this is basically solving a one-dimensional diffusion equation. Um, so heat transfer or diffusion or, or something like that, the burger's equation. Um, 
where we've got a setup of number of nodes that we're going to use for places we're going to calculate whether you call it temperature or uh, concentration um, that that's the number of points we're going to calculate that that value uh, we've got a field uh, uh, u half uh, so that's half a time step and then half of the second no I don't remember I, I have to remember exactly what the what those terms are but um, you know you end up you end up with the burgers equation and so solving it in serial we initialize the global field for this one the it's got periodic boundary condition uh, where the domain is 2 pi and so we're initializing the initial state to just uh, 10 times a sine wave so we're, we're just initializing things to a sine wave with a periodic boundary condition and then we're doing the standard derivatives with a periodic boundary condition so um, when uh, burgers so FTN serial serial compile and execute executes pretty quickly because we've got 240 nodes uh, we're only going to a tenth of a second um, but you can see that it ends up being sinusoidal we go from zero up to so after a tenth of a second the peak is reduced down to around 8.99 roughly nine and then you know comes back down to zero goes negative and then comes back up to zero right so you can see that that array ends up being sinusoidal anyway so how would we parallelize this with either OpenMP or do concurrent you know for sure that this loop cannot be done in parallel right every time step depends on the previous time step there's no way that we can do that in parallel but what loops could be done in parallel well that initial function is independent we could probably do the initialization in parallel that is probably not the bulk of the calculation time though right if you profile this you're probably going to find out that like we've spent very little time doing this compared to actually taking time steps so it's probably not even worth worrying about what about the derivatives well when we take the derivatives we're not modifying the field so every point along the field is independent when we're calculating the derivatives so that loop and that loop can be done in parallel so let's look let's uh briefly see what those look like so for do concurrent like i said we can't change that one to be parallel we can change this one to be parallel and it's easy so i guess i did um the, for the derivative we just change that do loop to do concurrent ditto for the second derivative so we can compile and execute that one let's let's see how long the serial version took uh, 0.007 seconds. Let's run these. Let's run these out to a second, just so we've got enough time to kind of make sense of do things go faster. Okay. So, eleven tenth of a second.
and you can see that since we ran it out to a tenth of a second, the, the magnitude dropped. So for the do concurrent, um, p num thread eight time do concurrent um, tenth of a second. So even then, we're still looking at small. Well, let's let's go out to a thousand nodes then. Serial time of serial execution two tenths of a second. There we go. P version or the do concurrent version takes felt like it took longer. Hmm. Wonder if there's some optimizations that it's doing for the serial version that it's not doing for the do concurrent version. Huh. Certainly something there for investigation. Uh, let's try out the OpenMP version. Uh, let's see, we changed that to a second and that to a thousand. So let's do the same there. So we've got a fair comparison. Um, what does the implementation look like? Again, we just OMP parallel do on each of those loops. There's our compilation command. And MP threads eight times open in P. And I would expect this to be basically identical to the do concurrent version. And I think it looks like it probably is. Yeah. So there's a couple of examples to play with. See if there are any questions. We append underscore all k to all numbers added yada 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 to real variables in order to keep the precision. Are there other ways to do this for code readability? No. Um, so for my examples here, you'll notice that I, I did not do that. Um, and that's because I'm using default real, right? I'm, I'm not using double precision. These examples aren't intended to be, you know, modifying, you know, try and use a higher precision in your codes, yeah, if you want to be able to switch between re, uh, single and double precision easy enough, you're going to have that kind parameter. Or if you're just using double precision in general, you're going to want to use that kind parameter. That for literals, yeah, you want to add that. Um, yeah, there's there's no other way to to write a literal floating point number that is not default real. The, the work list for the 2020Y standard has on it the po exploring a way to express, hey, this is the default precision that I want in this file or scope. So there might be a way in the future to change, to not need the underscore RK, but for now, yeah, just leave it. Um, any other questions? Feel free to unmute and shout any out if you got them. Otherwise, go 
play with the examples, come up with examples on your own if you want. Um, try stick, try using do concurrent, try using OpenMP, parallel do. Uh, go read up on more of the options for using OpenMP. There's a lot more you can do than just decorate do loops, but that's that one was kind of outside the scope for today's training. Um, yeah, I will keep monitoring the, the questions, especially all the way through the end of tomorrow. So if you think of any, you can go ahead and put them in there. Other than that, uh, I think we can give you back 15, 20 minutes of your day and call this the end of day one for the parallel training. Thank you all for coming and I hope to see most of you tomorrow.